Hi, good morning. <laughs> um, so I'm going to just say something in Hmong before I skip into English. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. I'm going to welcome you because I, I went to the U and I spent a lot of time on the St. Paul campus. So I feel like this is a, this is home in a way, right? <laughs> um, and uh, I heard that it was a it was a well attended event yesterday. So I know how difficult it is for people to give up their weekends and to um, be here on a Sunday when there's so many things happening in families. So thank you for coming. Um, so when I was asked to speak to all of you today, um, I was um, hesitant to be honest because even though um, um, I always have a lot of opinions and a lot of things to share, um, my family hasn't been farming for many years. Um, it was a very integral part of our um, um, American um, uh, acculturation process, but um, uh, I haven't, I, I have a tiny garden that I can hardly uh, <laughs> keep up with, so, but um, I'm hoping that um, uh, what I have to say today is still relevant for many of you who, who are um, farming now. And after some thought, I did feel that I could share my own journey here about farming and also, um, if nothing else, that I hope that I can offer some ways of thinking about the future in order for all of us to be more successful and, um, and then really doing that with greater intention um, for, for us to kind of create the, the world that we want to, to be a part of. So thank you very much for that. So what I'm going to talk about today is what can we do to prepare for a more successful future? And um, before I speak about that, I want to just talk a little bit about who I am and to share some, something personal about me, but also to talk about um, uh, me professionally. And then secondly, to share thoughts about the future. And really, because we're here in Minnesota, what, what is our starting context, right? Um, and then some concepts about um, what I think is important for us not to be uh, reactive in, in doing the kind of work that we want to do, but how we might be able to do that with greater intention. So I was born in a tiny village in Laos. Many of the people in here were too. Um, and as a child, um, I, I came to America. So many of you know, um, many of the people in this room may know about the Hmong history. Um, and since Bao was the keynote speaker yesterday, I'm sure she mentioned that 2015 marks the 40th uh, anniversary of Hmong arrival and other Southeast Asian Americans um, coming to America. So I just want to share, start off sharing a little bit about that journey. Um, so life in, in, for Hmong in Laos is very different than here in America, right? We, we are an agricultural people, people farmed for subsistence. Um, they didn't really farm to make a lip, they farmed to live but it wasn't even enough to actually uh, make a living, right? Um, and we lived in very ro remote uh, rural villages, right? So the urban coming here to urban centers is something that is very new. And that's why St. Paul is so well known across the world because it's the largest urban concentration of Hmong anywhere in the world. Even though the largest population of Hmong live in China, they don't live in urban centers. Um, and uh, people lived around their families, right, or extended families. So villages are uh, uh, um, where people live really are the heart and soul of who they are as a family. So it's not just many Americans that don't know a lot about the Hmong uh, during the... Um, 
uh, the, what we call the Vietnam War, but uh, on, in Southeast Asia, they call the American War. Um, so today, the Vietnam War feels like it's ancient history. And there's often a lot of resentment when uh, we talk about the needs of the community today because it does, 40 years ago, might feel like ancient history. So people feel like, well, you know, why don't those people just, you know, figure out how to be in America and, and people don't have um, a lot of perspective. And so it's not just Americans who don't really know this history about the people but also um, our young people who don't know very much, right? Um, but um, the Hmong were involved um, with the US um, during the Vietnam War because uh, they lived in a um, part of Laos that um, uh, was used to move um, sub uh, military supplies from north to south Vietnam. And even though Laos was supposed to be a neutral country and nobody was supposed to be in Laos, everybody was in Laos, right? <laughs> so more than um, six, 60,000 American soldiers died, but over 100,000 um, Hmong people died um, uh, during um, this war. And this is, um, of course, the famous General Vang Pao, and that young boy is my father. Um, so in 1973, when American soldiers returned home, America really disengaged. Um, and it wasn't until uh, 1975 when Laos completely fell to communism that the Hmong were sought for genocide and thousands began to make their way out of Laos. And, um, and at the same time, over 125,000 Vietnamese Americans also left uh, Vietnam. So this is me <laughs> when, when, when I was six. Uh, and uh, this is when I, um, my family came. Um, there were three waves of Hmong refugees. Um, the first wave was um, the mid-70s to the early 80s, and those were military families. So the family that had high priority for resettlement into this country. Um, and um, my family came to Chicago in 1979 in the mid, uh, as winter was just starting. So you can imagine the shock. <laughs> um, I had never seen snow before, um, and I'd never seen an elevator before, anything like that. And I remember standing as a six-year-old in front of an elevator and looking at people go in, and then the door would close. Then you know, a couple of seconds later, or uh, the door would open and new people would come out. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is what you do in America if you want to change. You just go in there. <laughs> so, uh, so you can imagine the shock, right? Um, I was a, a, a six-year-old child, and that's what I thought. And of course, when I told my mother, she, she, you know, she had never been in an elevator, but she knew enough that people didn't change just by going into an elevator. So this, um, so the second wave of um, Hmong uh, people that came to America came in the um, early to the early 80s to the early 90s. And those were really um, the uh, second wave of re resettlement that um, where people already had relatives here. So many people um, followed their families and were resettled in areas where they had family um, support. Um, and then the last wave is um, uh, happened in the the early to mid um, 2000s, and those were the remaining refugees who um, who were resettled from Thailand, specifically from Wat Tham Um So, when we came to America, the focus was really a, on economic self-sufficiency, right? Um, because the goal is to try to get all of um, us into the workforce as quickly as um, possible. And even though um, my family, as you can see, my father was involved in the conflict for so long, um, you know, the thought of actually trying to assess how people were doing first and supporting them was not really something that was thought about. So my father went straight to work the week after we 
got to America. And he did that because we, he had an older brother who was working at the solo co company um, in Chicago and he got him a job and he just went to work. And then my mother started taking English classes and she took all of us to her English class. So, um, so everybody knew that in America you, you could no longer farm, right? You needed to find and make money in order to survive. Um, what's significant also about the Southeast Asian resettlement um, is that it was the largest um, wave of refugee resettlement to this country, and it really shaped how the U.S. Uh, now thinks about refugee resettlement and created the Refugee Act of 1980, um, which created the Office of Refugee Resettlement, right? So, um, so this is, uh, again, just my family in Chicago a couple years after we came. So my siblings and I with my mother. So not so different from many uh, Americans, uh, my family, when I asked my mother about why they wanted to come to America, um, she shares that, you know, they didn't know very much about America, but they wanted a better life for their children, right? They'd heard um, that here their kids could go to school and things like that. And then they wanted to be free from oppression, right? They were so fearful about their lives. And so they wanted to be in a country where they felt like they would have some freedom. Um, and then, you know, my mother always says, you know, you want to be in a place where you can be useful, right? Um, people don't go um, to an area just to ask for help. They're really thinking about what it is that they can do to be useful to the world. And um, often, um, unfortunately, we don't start on building on people's assets. And so having worked in the community for a long time, um, I often wonder what it would have been like if, um, if we had taken really good stock of the kinds of skills that um, my family and other refugees and immigrants bring to this country um, in order to, um, you know, get them the kinds of jobs where they could um, uh, use those skills more easily. Um, so to do this, farming was a really big part of our family's um, history. Um, and we started farming the year after we got to America, just on, at a church plot, right? Um, and that was not to earn income, but it was really to, um, so that my parents could grow the things that they wanted to eat. You can imagine in 1980, there wasn't a lot of things that we see in the grocery stores today, right? <laughs> or the farmer's markets. So my parents really wanted to, you know, have some of their vegetables. And my mom came, even though we came with like one bag, she carried some seeds with her. Um, so they planted what they call mung cucumbers and mung corn, and I never knew the difference. I mean, now I know, but then I was like, what do you mean mung corn? Like that's different than, you know, other kinds of corn. Um, and then by the time I was in junior high, we were traveling to, um, Iowa and Wisconsin to detassel corn or to um, farm ginseng and, and things like that. And then by the time I got to high school, we were doing cucumber farming. Um, and all the money that we made were, would go to a family pot, right? So I didn't know that, you know, other teenagers got allowances. <laughs> I just thought that, uh, you know, you made you, you make money and then it goes to the family plot. And I think when you are um, new to a country, um, well, we, we weren't so new by then, but when you're still poor, um, I think everyone thinks about, don't think about money in the same way, right? So um, I don't think I got my, my own allowance until um, I was in 11th grade and then at the end of, uh, season, my mom gave us each $100, and we're like, wow, <laughs> that's amazing. What are we going to do? Um, so I know that in this room, there are many um, similar stories. Um, and so given this kind of history, um, 
and this kind of journey, I know the resilience that resides in the room and how much people want to have a better life in America. So what is it that we can all do better to ensure that um, we do, we have some chance of success, uh, especially here in Minnesota. So I wanna just switch a little bit and talk about what is our starting place in Minnesota, right? Especially for immigrants and um, minorities in the state. And for a long time, I really thought that um, it was just me, that I couldn't figure it out, or that it was my family, if they were just more, my parents, if they were just more educated. But we do have some real uh, challenging conditions in Minnesota that I think is really important for all of you to know. You don't have to know the specifics, but I think it would be um, good if you had a starting uh, a sense of what's actually happening here in Minnesota as well, right? So as we think about the future, one thing to know in Minnesota is that we are getting more diverse, right? So, um, and people often think it's just in the Twin Cities, but all over the state we have growing diversity, right? And that diversity is being fueled by um, people um, coming from all over the world, and not just um, those of us who came as refugees, even though in Minnesota um, there are still many refugees, but there are many immigrants from all over the world um, who are changing uh, the face of Minnesota as well. So even though Minnesota's urban areas are more diverse than its rural areas, it's also quickly changing um, because we, happen to live in a state that has a lot of um, economic opportunities and that brings a lot of people, um, both highly educated but also um, those who want opportunity. And so um, from 1990 to 2000 now, <laughs> um, the white population grew by 2% and the population of um, color grew by 68%, right? So, um, it's gonna change Minnesota. The second fact is that Minnesotans are aging and retiring. Right? Um, in particular, whites are um, growing um, older and in the next uh, decade, we're gonna see the largest transition of people um, in the workforce in the white community that are going to retire. Um, and on this chart, what's interesting is the green, um, the green um, color represents people of color and the red color represents whites. And you can see from the age that um, the majority of the young people are people of color, right? So as we have an aging population um, that is mo more white, we have a young population that is more people of color. So it really matters what we're gonna do with each other, right? Because um, w a lot of our children and us, we are gonna be responsible for taking care of the retiring community, right? So it's projected that by 2020, uh, the older adult um, population will grow from 750,000 to 1.4 uh, million um, people, right? And then the working age um, population will remain steady at about three and a half million people. So that means you're gonna have a much, um, uh, many more older people and then uh, not really a lot of new workers, but a lot of those new workers are going to be people of color, right? Also, Minnesota has some of the worst disparities between whites and people of color, right? And this is along almost every benchmark, including um, income, education, housing, um, all kinds of um, uh, benchmarks. Um, and so as a state, um, if you guys follow politics, um, right after the President's State of the Union Address, Political came out with um, this rating of states, and Mer Minnesota came out on top, right, as the number one state in the country. Um, and, but when you compare it to how, um, 
how, how Minnesota ranks among other states in terms of um, um, along a whole bunch of other benchmarks um, in terms of disparities, we are at the bottom, um, if you can believe it. <laughs> so I know this is, um, this is um, not something new for many of you, but it's important for us in this room to, know, to understand because we are part of the solution to that, right? I believe you're all here today because you not only want to be successful, but you want to be able to uh, access opportunities and um, find resources so that we can bridge that disparity. And what we do with each other is going to be crucial to helping move those benchmarks. So I want to just um, talk a little bit about the future and some ways to think about how we problem solve um, for the future. So I consider myself a social entrepreneur and that just means that I'm really opportunistic and optimist <laughs> and, and optimist about the future. So um, what I often use in my um, work with community um, is really two uh, simple but also complex concepts, right? One is really that the world is shrinking, right? And we are increasingly more global. So it's interesting, this is just a map of people on Facebook. It doesn't follow, it, it, it's not meant to follow the map, but it kind of resembles the map of the world and people are more connected than ever, right? I can't tell you how many of my aunts and uncles who are on Facebook, who are connecting to their relatives in Laos or um, you know, just um, connecting everywhere, right? So this is a great benefit to all of us because um, it's facilitating um, uh, a lot of uh, relationships that people wanna maintain but people are also forming many new relationships, right? And this is really important because one of your most important assets as a person is the relationships that you have, right? And when we come to uh, Minnesota or any, when we go to any new place, um, what we take with us is those sets of relationships and then also um, our ability to form many new relationships. And we have to do that because um, those relationships are essential to our success, right? Um, and um, this is also really um, uh, important because even here in Minnesota, we can see how the global connectivity of the world and that's facilitated by us all being here, coming here, but also by how uh, Minnesotans are connecting to the world. And it's really changing our palates, right? Um, I mean, I find man mangosteen, which for a long time I had to just go to New York to even taste. Um, and now I can find it in, you know, grocery stores, right? So we have access to food that, um, we probably shouldn't have. <laughs> and then, um, but it's also changing the way that Americans uh, consume food and um, uh, uh, what is becoming popular in terms of like restaurateurs and some of the um, most young talented chefs are um, chefs who are coming from other countries, right? In Ethiopia, um, uh, Korea, that are really changing uh, the landscape of um, what Minnesotans are um, tasting in their mouths. So this is really important um, for, for local diversity. The second concept is really um, what I um, and many people call social innovation. And so I want to just break that down a little bit. And social innovation is because the world is changing so fast, past success no longer dictates future success, right? So there's a couple of things to keep in mind um, as we all uh, do work, um, our work. Um, and so social innovation is really about finding a new way to grow r wiser, right? So we can be, uh, do the things that we need to do uh, to be uh, as successful as possible. Um, so one thing is we can no longer just wait for someone to tell us the answer, right? 
Um, and we have to think about, um, in this case, um, who you are producing your food for. Right? You have to get to know your customers more. Right? And um, I say this because um, I know how uncomfortable it is when you don't speak English and you have to think about um, how, how do I talk to somebody, right? Uh, customers, if you sell at the farmer's market and you have customers that are coming and they're just looking at your vegetables, but they're your primary consumers, right? And if you never engage them, then you don't really know what, what they're thinking, you know, what else they would like to see, what they think about your vegetables, and all of those things. So social innovation really is three simple concepts, which is that you have to be people-centered, right? You can't just work really hard. Working really hard is important, but if you don't know the people that you're producing for, that can be a restaurant, that can be you know, the customers at the farmer's market, um, your product is not going to be as successful, right? The second is to collaborate. Um, and while well, you guys are all doing that by being here, um, is to, um, to think about how you're gonna work with uh, many others because no one person has all the answers, right? And so it's better to think about, well, who has this resource or who would have an idea for this that I can ask or who's the expert on um, seedlings or who's the expert on you know, something that, um, I, that can help me think through this. So we have to be much more um, uh, willing to ask for help and to really collaborate. And then the third is to be experimental. And um, this concept is really about trying new ideas, right? Um, for example, um, I often read, and I know this, because I'm on a much more Western American diet, which means I'm consuming a lot of meat and not enough vegetables, and um, it shows in my health. And a lot of our traditional diets are much more healthy, right? But people don't know how to make it. So, you know, what if we were much more intentional about being able to produce the kinds of vegetables that are, um, you know, not only organic or local or all of those things, but we teach the world how to eat more traditional food, right? Like the, the ways in which um, um, we used to eat, right? And I. I say that because I have the same challenge with my mother who thinks my, my child needs a Western uh, diet and so she cooks something separate for, for her but then she'll cook a traditional dish for herself. And I said, I would rather that she eat that dish than, <laughs> than the dish that you're cooking for her, right? But somehow in our heads, we've got, we um, have gotten to the point where we think um, our food is not as good, or children don't want to eat that, right? So we're learning now that actually uh, vegetables are very important. Um, we should be consuming probably about 20% less meat than we are now. <laughs> um, and, um, and actually cooking them in the traditional ways in which we were cooking them are, is much healthier. So how do we experiment? Um, bringing those um, knowledge and wisdom that we have to a new market that we have here, right? Um, so what I want to say is um, we, we're going to just try a quick exercise because my time's up. So I just want you to think for yourself. What's one group of customers that I want to hear from this year, okay? And how can you hear from them? So even if like you put a survey, survey box next to your stand and they write in English, it's okay because you can try to find someone to interpret that, right? Just like, you know, ask a question so you get to know the people who are picking up your stuff, right? Or if you happen to be a producer that produces for um, a grocery store, ask them why they've chosen to buy from you, right? How do you get to know 
that consumer base a lot more. So um, just think about that for this year. I'm trying to make it simple. What's one group of customers that you really want to uh, hear from this year? And then um, who's the one person or organization that you want to meet to discuss an idea, right? And people always feel like they have to know the answer before they go and uh, talk to somebody. But actually, all you have to want to do is to go and ask and say, hey, I have this idea. What do you think, right? Um, so just think about that and be intentional so you connect with somebody. And today is a great place because you're already here. So don't just go and ask them, please teach me. Just say, I have an idea for this. What do you think? Or what can you help me with, right? Um, and then lastly, if you have a new idea, put it out there. Say, I want to try this, right? What if I offer this and, you know, with this or, you know, anything? So the point is you don't have to know the answers before you ask these things. Um, but you need to put your ideas out there so that other people can um, offer, uh, you know, if they have some resource for you, they can say, here, go talk to this person, or hey, it'd be great, maybe you apply for this loan, right, or things like that. So what's one new idea that you have that you want to just put out there and just say, I don't know, I don't know what will happen, but here's what I've been thinking about, right? So, um, so if you kind of answer these three questions, it is essentially what I talked about, which is how do you stay socially innovative for the future? Because we can't just follow the past uh, um, recipes for success. They don't work for the future because things are changing too quickly, right? Now, you don't just rely on the news. In fact, I don't have cable because I know more about the world just by reading things on Twitter or listening to you know uh, radio programs that now I have access to because of internet and things around the world, right? It's a much more reliable source. Um, so you also have that um, opportunity. So I hope that's been useful, and I thank you again for uh, allowing me to be a part of your day. Thank you. Let's run the fire. Baby, why? So, baby.